Welcome to University Place Presents. I'm Norman Gilliland. The more we learn about food in the 19th century in America, the more we marvel that anybody survived. In order to extend the life of the product, in order to make it look better, or just to make more money off it, food processors in this country often added things which could sicken or even kill the consumer. Well, what did the U.S. government do about it? And what did the food processors do about it? And how did big business react? Well, we're going to find out from my guest. She's Deborah Blum, returning to University Place Presents. She's the author of various books, including The Poison Squad, and also a Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist, author of various other books, and is also the director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And welcome back to University Place Presents. Thank you, it's great to be here. <laughs> Food in the 19th century, we have this fairly, uh, I suppose, idealized uh, impression of it when we look back, you know, like grandmother used to make and that kind of thing but I gather it wasn't exactly wonderful. No, and I bought into that same kind of mythology of the 19th century, everyone pink-cheeked, eating farm fresh, perfect produce, and it's totally untrue. I don't know how we got sold that kind of story. So I was actually, when I started working on the book, really shocked to realize that what my grandparents and great-grandparents ate was truly horrible, right? And in fact, I was talking about this book at the FDA a couple weeks ago, and their historians said the estimate is that food was one of the top 10 causes of death in the 19th century. And if you look at them now, it's not, you know, you don't see it anywhere near that. So we have come a long, much better way since then. Well, okay, speaking about grandma first though, was this mostly an urban phenomenon? And if people lived out on the farm and raised their own, they presumably wouldn't have tampered with the food. Yes, I think largely, but I know that it was spread across the country. And, and when we say urban, we say very small areas. People would go to the grocery store. They would buy to flush out whatever they raised themselves, canned goods. Or you would go to the grocery store, you'd get your flour, which was mixed with gypsum. You'd get your ground coffee, which was mixed with charred bone. You'd buy your spices, your brick dust and your cinnamon. So you really couldn't escape this sort of fraud and chicanery and, and risky practices of manufacturers no matter where you were. You were maybe safer on a farm, but you were never buffered from mod the food practices of the 19th century. Was this just an American phenomenon or uh, No, elsewhere? you know, I mean, Cheating in food is time old, and you can go back even into the records of ancient Rome and Greece and hear and find things about you know faked wine and other things like that. But awareness of it really arose in Europe in the early 19th century. There was a famous book called Death in the Pot by a chemist based in London, and it was published in 1820. And it really explored all kinds of dangerous additives to manufactured food. And that chemist really focused on uh, heavy metals in the food supply, the use of um, lead to dye candy, the use of arsenic, which is a metalloid element, to dye candy again. Green from arsenic, yellow and red from lead is kind of crazy. <laughs> And eventually, in England at least, there was a law passed in the 1860s after a couple dozen kids just outside London died from eating arsenic lace candy. And they started saying enough. But that didn't happen in the United States. Even though we had a similar kind of situation, we, the U.S. government still refused to actually set standards or regulate food and drink or well, drugs. What do you think the difference was? You know, I've asked myself that. Um, part of it, I think, is the American character. We really don't, really don't like the government telling us what to do. And you see people, actually food safety chemists, complaining about that in the 19th century. You know, Americans are so focused on keeping the government out of their kitchen that they don't think about this bigger picture. So that was some of it. We were a younger country, so we had less of a history, barely 100 years old in the late 19th century, less of a history of having government, you know, set rules and standards. And in our case, uniquely, I think, 
we had two other factors. One was, you know, business had never been regulated. They organized and pushed back very effectively. And, and, and it's something that we'll remind you of today, gave a lot of money to Congress to make sure that happened, didn't happen. And the Civil War still haunted the country. Um, so that you had a lot of southern states saying, I would never let that Yankee government tell me what to do, even after the Civil War. So you had all of those factors blocking these efforts to try to make the food supply safer. How aware were Americans in general of the problem, though? I mean, when you have children dying after eating candy or drinking milk. Right. I mean, in some specific cases where you had a very acute poisoning, I think people were aware. For the most part, the danger of the food supply was kind of a mystery. And part of that is, if you really think about what it was like before regulations, it wasn't just that the government was saying to companies, you know, you need to safety test what goes into your food. You need to set limits on how much of a particular additive you put in your food. And oh, by the way, you need to put labels on your food. And so there were no labels. So in the case of a child dying, say, of uh, a popular preservative in milk was formaldehyde. Yeah, it's hard um, to believe. And it's, I'm going to come back to, to that. It's just crazy. <laughs> you know, your kid would die, but people were sick a lot in the 19th century. You know, sometimes you actually didn't make that connection, right? And then there was no real public health tracking of this. I actually talked to a food historian or a medical histor historian at the University of Michigan about it, and he said, in general, people th look back at the 19th century and they call it, the, in America, the century of the American stomach ache, <laughs> because so yeah. many people didn't feel well all the time. Between, uh, you know, catching a disease. Right, that's right. Or who right. knows what else, lead in the water pipes. Exactly, and so it was really difficult to sort it out, and if you didn't know what was going into your food anyway, as an individual, you could hardly make the connection. So who made the connection? Well, eventually, the hero of my book, <laughs> Harvey Washington Wiley, comes to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And that's really important because he goes there in 1883. He's an Indiana-raised farm boy. He's, I always think of him as kind of a holy roller chemist. His father was a preacher and a conductor on the Underground Railroad during the Civil War. And, and Wiley actually was a soldier on the Union side in the Civil War. And he had become a professor of chemistry at Purdue when it started. He was one of a faculty of six. And he, there he got very interested in fraud in the Indiana food supply. And he started looking at fake sugars and fake syrup and fake honey. And his sugar work caught the attention of the federal government. And in 1883, he was recruited to run what was called the Bureau of Chemistry. Now at this time, because we don't have any consumer protection laws, there's no FDA, there's no EPA, there is no agency dedicated to keeping the food supply safe except the USDA and they had never done it. So when Wiley came into this tiny unit of chemists, there were maybe a dozen of them, he comes in and he says, let's just investigate. I mean, that was how he started. What's really in the food supply? And so he took these chemists who were, had spent many years analyzing soils and crop chemistry, and he said, I want you to go out and investigate dairy products. That was the first. And let's investigate canned vegetables, and let's investigate cocoa and tea and coffee. They I mean, they went across the landscape. And booze? And booze, <laughs> that's right. Wine, beer, whiskey. There was nothing that they didn't look at. And when you read these, they were a series of reports called the Bulletin 13 reports. They're just an incredible portrait of an awful, troubled, corrupt food supply. And I think he was able to get away with it for so long because industry itself didn't realize what these reports were going to show. But they built a really damning portrait. Let's talk about motive a little bit. Not not Wiley's, I think that was pretty clear what he was after, but you talk about fraud. Right. Uh, that's, so that's misrepresentation of the product on the one hand, but then there's also, I don't know, would you say uh, an unknowing um, component to some of these where we didn't know that the formaldehyde was going to kill people or we didn't know that the chalk in the milk was going to sicken children? I mean, some. Right. Formaldehyde, it became very obvious very fast that it was a poisonous substance, right? 
But some of the other additives in the food supply, they use the cleaning agent borax was a popular preservative, uh, salicylic acid, which we find in aspirin, mm -hmm. right, was a popular preservative. They put um, copper sulfate was used to make vegetables green. There was the continued use of arsenic and other things in candy. Um, to uh, color the candy. Some things they knew, some things they were just making up as they went. And, we, and the late 19th century is the rise of industrial chemistry. So all of these compounds are suddenly available and you're in this period where science is kind of magic. Right? Suddenly you have these miraculous compounds that can extend food, color it better, make it taste different, disguise rot. Right? It's like, you know, science is our friend. So I think there was actually a period where people were both knowingly using dangerous things and just thinking they were in this miraculous period where science was solving all their problems and they didn't want to look too closely at what that meant. I guess part of it must have been just this broader distribution as you get into the, you know, better transportation, communication. You might be in New York making candy, but then sending it to somebody in Denver. Yes, that's exactly right. And there was a, there's a point in the book where I, I relate this phone call that the food chief food chemist in North Dakota has with the uh, lawyers from Nabisco in which he's yelling at them that he's tired of East Coast company dumping their garbage <laughs> into the, the state of North Dakota where people are eating all of these chemically enhanced horrible foods. So it goes out, the railroads start crisscrossing the country, right? You start seeing this widespread shipping. And again with that, you want really good preservatives. There wasn't great refrigeration, right? We didn't have electricity in many, many places. So chemical preservatives were the go-to thing. Well, let's enter into what we might call Deborah Blum's rogues gallery here, <laughs> uh, starting with an image of a candy factory. Yes, so I love this image of the candy factory, which I use in my book, and that's in part because this is really what factories of the time looked like. There were no government inspectors saying, why don't we keep these clean, right? Why don't, you know, let's have sterile conditions. Let's make sure there's not dirt in the floor and pools of water and flies gathering around. So if you look at this picture, you can see just how filthy often these processing conditions were. But the other part of it is on that there's a, I think at one point I had a, a an image of um, an inspector from Wiley's group and you will see the reference to children dying of poison candy. So, you know, it's like this double whammy of dirt and toxic substances. And then you can go on to look at some of the misleading claims. So again, you know, you can say whatever you want, right? I mean, it was interesting because Wisconsin was part of the great butter fight of the 1880s, <laughs> right? In which everyone was so irate because the Chicago meat producers were making oleomargarine. And, and we don't remember this, most of us, but in the 19th century, oleomargarine was made from animal fat. And so you had the meat packers like Armour and Cudahy and Smith saying, what do we do with all this unwanted fat? we'll make oleomargarine. And so oleomargarine was this animal fat product and they would call it butter, they would dye it yellow, and then you can get into these big fights in Congress with dairy state people, including Bob La Follette, saying, you know, fraud, chicanery, they're scraping animal carcasses off the streets and putting it in your butter. I mean, it gets to be a real dogfight between the traditionalists and, and you could describe it as anything. You could call coffee nutritious without even telling people what in the world that meant. Or you could fake all kinds of things in ground coffee. I mean, an incredible amount of fakery in coffee. So, you know, it looks great, doesn't it? Everybody gathered around the table there and enjoying, well, what are they actually drinking, do you suppose? That's exactly <laughs> right. And sometimes things like nutritive, or there, you would sometimes find cans of coffee that would say coffee essence, which if you actually knew what was going on meant there's no coffee in this at all. It's essence of coffee, <laughs> right? And then so what was that? It was burnt charred ground seeds, right? And chicory and spice, sometimes other flavorings, or but mostly what people would do. And Wiley's chemists found that cough, ground coffee at this time period was 
you know, between 50 and 90 percent what adulterated, which usually meant it was extended, right? Was this just to save a buck? I mean, yes. really? It was okay, mu- no these things were much cheaper. So coffee's expensive, right? As we all know today when we drink a cup of coffee. But you, if you mixed in uh, burnt rope or ground coconut shells or charred bone, which they sometimes did, or, you know, dyed sawdust, which they often used, then you could extend out the coffee. There'd still be a slight coffee buzz, and you would make a lot more money because you were charging for real coffee. And there was actually this insane moment when I was looking at this when people start getting very suspicious of ground coffee. So they start faking the coffee beans, right? And they made those out of wax and dirt. And so I actually read this one statement from a doctor in the Midwest who said that he thought the origin of the phrase a muddy cup of coffee (laughs) was because people drank so much dirt with their daily breakfast. But they said the same thing with spices, right? Spices were famously up to 90% adulterated. Because they are expensive often. That's exactly right. And so they would use um, all kinds of different materials and grind them up. Pepper, it brought, pepper was famously mostly coconut shells. And the U.S. government actually went out and did a sting once where they sprayed a bunch of coconut shells on the dock with quinine and then tested McCormick pepper and found it was full of quinine, (laughs) right? And and literally- McCormick. McCormick, right? So Yeah, that wasn't just these little small random things, the big companies were doing it. And of course, cinnamon would have brick dust in it, so would cayenne, right? Flour, we had gypsum or um, sometimes just ground stone. I've always wondered about like what settled to the bottom of a loaf of bread (laughs) where you were crunching your way through the gypsum. So it was sort of like crazy times, and you would actually start to see in response to this manufacturers trying to persuade the public that their product was pure, right? They'd put pure on the product, pure spices, pure whiskey. Whiskey fraud was huge. Well, whiskey, beer, and wine. So you would go out and you would have, especially the Kentucky (laughs) bourbon makers, it would be pure whiskey, pure rye. You were something, yeah, that, that's what they would call it. Yes, that's mm. exactly right. And, of course, there was a long tradition of uh, people um, dying from bad liquor of one kind or another, as you point out in the Poisoner's Handbook. That's right. If it's, uh, it's not ethanol, which is what mm. we drink, if it's methanol, which is wood <laughs> alcohol, that is super lethal, mm. right? But in a lot of cases, what they do here is they'd put up, they'd say, I'm going to sell you an expensive bottle of aged rye. And they'd use um, manufactured ethanol. It was just made in a lab. And then they'd dye it. And you could buy little things called flavor of rye or flavor of bourbon. And you could buy compounds that would make it bead on the glass the way a good whiskey does. And then you could sell it as if it was a 10-year-old whiskey. So it's a real dogfight about whiskey. And I, and I want to briefly mention, yeah, my book really focuses on food and drink, largely food, some drink, medicated soft drinks. Um, but this is also a period of completely unregulated over-the-counter medications. So you would have narcotics come on the market and end up in your everyday products. There was a whole rush of a period where people thought cocaine was a wonderful thing. They would mix it into wine. The Pope actually blessed some of these cocaine-rich wines, right? And then if you think about uh, what they used to call medicated soft drinks, right? So 7-Up was uh, loaded with lithium. It was an upper, so they called it 7-Up. It pepped you up in seven ways. It had had lithium? Mm Mm-hmm. It was a lithium-based soft drink. And Coca-Cola, of course, was the name itself tells you it was, it was made from cocaine. And, it, and in the early iterations of Coca-Cola, you can actually find ads in which they're saying, you know, all the stimulating properties of the coca plant and this incredible in- intellect improving beverage. And Coca-Cola was almost, was largely cocaine in about till about 1902. And then it wasn't the federal government, the state of Georgia forced them to take it out. Wasn't cocaine a little expensive though? Or was it just a very minute quantity to give it what it was supposed to have? You know, I I actually, that's a good question about the price of cocaine. There was apparently enough of a market in it because it was legal, 
that it wasn't that expensive. I think it got much more expensive once it became, you know, kind of an under-the-counter <laughs> drug. But at the time, you could just bring in a truckload of cocaine and mix it into your uh, soft drinks. And, and Coca-Cola wasn't the only cocaine-rich beverage, right? Wiley and his team eventually did a whole investigation of medicated soft drinks and started shutting them down. How did they determine, though, the state of Georgia, that cocaine was uh, undesirable if everybody else thought it was good at the time? Well, there started to be some real pushback against some of these narcotics. I mean, if you actually drill down into some of the use of narcotics at the time, it wasn't just that you had cocaine in wines and in soft drinks. You had morphine in baby, like, tooth drops. Oh, what? sure, to calm the child yeah, by exactly knocking That's exactly right. Out. That's exactly right. And so people started to see these really bad effects. And cocaine itself, which was promoted by Sigmund Freud, actually, is a helpful alternative to heroin, right? Oh, well. He actually okay. published a say. famous paper <laughs> called On Cocaine. Um, <laughs> But cocaine itself eventually became realized as an addictive substance. And people started realizing that morphine was not a benign substance. And so you saw actually organizations like the WCTU, which came, became very famous for opposing alcohol, started out really pushing back on some of these medicated soft drinks because people were really high after they had their, you know, handy glass of Coca-Cola. <laughs> so, I mean, it's really a crazy time, right? And all completely legal, so. Was that uh, recipe for Coca-Cola, was it still secret, though, uh, once they took the cocaine out of it? You know, it's interesting because much later, Wiley sued the Coca-Cola company. Um, uh, Harvey Wiley, who's the hero of my book, sues the Coca-Cola <laughs> company for a number of reasons. And one was that he thought they should quit calling it Coca-Cola because it didn't have cocaine <laughs> anymore. And it was false advertising. And they even you know, said, you're using pictures, of, and they did, too, pictures of the coca plant on your trucks and boxes because they really wanted to hint to people that it was this wonderful stimulating beverage, right? But the other thing they had done is so uh, once they took the cocaine out, they ramped up the amount of caffeine to an incredible degree. So an old six-ounce soda fountain glass of Coca-Cola was about the same thing as a 16-ounce can of Red Bull today. And they were, you know, serving this in soda fountains to toddlers and <laughs> elementary school kids. And so he sued them. It was a trial much later, about 1911. And it's a fabulous trial because it's the first real trial that looks at the chemistry and effects of caffeine. Right. And some of the best early work on wh whether caffeine is dangerous came out of Wiley's lawsuit against Coca-Cola. And they did not win that lawsuit which was actually carefully scheduled in one of the bottling towns that bottled Coca-Cola, oh, okay. right? A little change of venue might have helped. Super friendly to Coca-Cola, mm. but the federal government did not quit on this, and they bulldog Coke. And so about in 1917, Coke pulled the caffeine amount in, in their product down by about half. So uh, Because uh, the, originally they would want the caffeine in it because that, too, is addictive? A stimulant, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't. I think there are people who would describe themselves as caffeine addicts, and I've certainly met people, uh, even in my own journalism school here at Wisconsin, who, if they did, missed a cup of coffee, would start getting a really bad headache, right? Yeah. There are things that keep you kind of on the caffeine mm -hmm. diet. Uh, so it was partly that, but it was partly that Coca Cola had built its reputation as something that pepped you up. And so when they couldn't put cocaine to pep you up, they just ramped up the caffeine to these insane levels. And the interesting thing is, back when Wiley's trial came out, the nickname for Coca-Cola in the United States was dope. <laughs> and so, and people would describe Coca-Cola addicts. They brought in Coca-Cola addicts to testify at this trial as dope heads, right? <laughs> Which, and the Coca-Cola company was very irate about that. And then they would call cocaine, they would call Coca-Cola Coke, right. which was a nickname for cocaine. So that goes back that far. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> so it's super interesting, complicated history on soft drinks. Well, let's go back into childhood, but we're still in the rogues gallery. Yes. And uh, look at milk. Yes. So. Milk was one of my favorite case studies of why the food supply was so bad. And that was in part, that was for a number of reasons, right? You're in the 19th century. The U.S., there's no pasteurization, right? Milk is a 
fabulous substrate for pathogenic bacteria. It's got proteins and sugars that provide a wonderful home from, real, from some really dangerous bacteria. And in the 19th century in particular, you found a lot of bovine tuberculosis in the milk. I mean, people got really sick from milk. It, it, was, uh, it was lethal to a lot of people. I gather refrigeration wasn't really up to code either. No, I mean, especially when you used to go, you know, sort of to the mid, there isn't refrigeration. There's, you know, we're just starting in the late 19th century to, you know, use electricity. Uh, the old phrase, an ice box, was right. because people would get a block of ice, right? And they'd put, you know, have a box for it. And so that was your best way of chilling things. So you had a lot of problems just with the bacteria growing in milk anyway, but you had a lot of efforts by the dairy industry, and I'm gonna use the term dairyman because that's what everyone said, the dairy, American dairyman, um, also wanted to make greater profits. And so there was a widespread practice of thinning milk. And you can actually find the recipes, which is about one gallon of milk to two gallons of water. When you did that, of course, you ended up with this grayish, bluish kind of thin liquid and that you had to so, recolor. It's yeah, gross, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it sounds um, gross for, before you color it. Yeah, and so they would put plaster of Paris in it, or they would put chalk in it and recolor it. They didn't really fuss about the quality of the water that they thinned it with. So speaking of pathogenic mm. bacteria, there was one famous case in Indianapolis where a family brought their milk bottle and it was wiggling. And they, when they analyzed what was in the milk, it was horsehair worms from a local pond, right? The, and the and that, dairy managers, Oh, because that's where they got the water. That was where they got the water, right. And then occasionally, dairy farmers, you know, they would lose calves. How do we use the different parts? They were very good about trying to use everything. And so they would puree the calf brains, which would make a kind of creamy layer, and they would float them on the top of this thinned milk to make it look like it had golden, creamy, you know, stuff floating on top. And it would be a giveaway when you poured it in your hot coffee and it cooked. <laughs> so, which is completely disgusting. Yeah. But the other part of this is that you found them then saying, my biggest problem is that, you know, people are buying less milk because it keeps rotting and it's an expensive product, but what if we can make the milk last longer? So during the Civil War, they had discovered this wonderful new embalming agent called formaldehyde, and the Germans had learned to synthesize it, and so you could make vats of formaldehyde. And literally, the dairy industry said, well, you know, this obviously preserves body. What about milk? And so they started putting it in milk, and it worked really well. It actually, I haven't drunk formaldehyde, <laughs> but it has a kind of Swedish taste, apparently, so it would mask the souring of the milk. What does it smell like? It, it does not have a strong smell at all. Mm -hmm. You can barely smell it. And then it did preserve the milk. So they would actually, you could actually find ads in which it said, Buy our wonderful milk. You can put it on your counter and leave it there for two weeks and nothing will happen, right? Which today, we would all kind of go, ew. But again, then it was miracle of science. So you started getting these embalmed milk scandals. That's what they called it, where children would die because there was so much formaldehyde in the milk. But the dairymen were never prosecuted because it was not illegal to do this. And then you saw the meat industry pick up the same thing. They would take formaldehyde, they would take borax, they would put all these weird preservatives in milk. And so companies like Swift were eventually prosecuted by the War Department after the Spanish-American War because of the use of all these preservatives. And Teddy Roosevelt, who had been a rough writer, testified that when he had forced one of his soldiers to eat the canned meat, uh, the soldier had started throwing up, right? and he ended up by saying, I would have rather eaten my hat than eat these meat supplies. And that was actually called the embalmed beef scandal, right? It ginned up a huge amount of publicity. In a way, uh, in quotation marks, a good thing, I suppose, because, uh, for a couple of reasons, I'm talking about the Spanish-American War and the embalmed beef scandal, uh, in effect, you have a control group with the, with the military. I mean, these yes. are all soldiers, these are all healthy people, certain age group, and if they're all getting sick by eating the same thing coming out of a can. Right. Yes. Then you've got a pretty, and then you get uh, somebody with um, celebrity clout involved like Theodore Roosevelt. In a way, you have a perfect storm to stop the embalmed beef, right? 
You would have thought, right? I mean, the interesting thing, and, and this should have made people even more angry, is that the conclusion of that military trial was that it was no big deal because that's just the stuff that everyone bought in the grocery store, that this was the actual state of the American food supply. But the real effect of that, it going back to did people know this, is the embalmed milk scandals and, and the huge national attention from the embalmed beef scandals started making people realize that there were unsafe products in their food. You know, I think that we had, they had lived through this golden period of not really realizing what it was like. And certainly there's no labels, right? The U.S. government is not really getting this information out. Wiley for quite a while did these Bulletin 13 for other food chemists, not for the general public. So you start to see right about at this period this sort of rise of public awareness. You get pure food congresses. You get food advocate magazines. You just start seeing people, including Wiley, starting to say, we have to fix this. This is really bad. And so, and you need that. We never change anything until the weight of public opinion starts getting behind a question. Well, though with Theodore Roosevelt, we're talking by now, I mean, he's president shortly by 1901. Right. And he realizes that there's a problem with this embalmed beef and maybe some other aspects of American uh, food culture. As president, what does, what does he do? Well, at that particular time, he didn't do anything. And when the food advocates would meet with him, he said to them, it wasn't that he was trying not to, uh, to regulate corporations. He was famously trust busting. But he said to them, you know, I don't want to waste all my political capital on the fight I'm going to lose. And the food industry and the drink industry are so organized against this, which they were, and they give so much money to Congress that I just don't think, that, and he actually said this, this is not a fight that I'm going to waste capital on because it's not a fight that I'm going to win. I think I can be more effective looking at things like railroads, which were some of his early targets, right? And so he, at that moment, was really focused there. What happens, though, is that Wiley, is who has been working with Congress trying to get some of some kind of you know requirement for labeling or some kind of safety standards and all these bills keep getting shot down he finally runs out of patience and he says okay right maybe what we don't have is the weight of evidence you know we talk about these things being dangerous there's anecdotal evidence that these are a problem but there's no good scientific studies which there were not Right, We just didn't have that kind of science. Toxicology was still being invented at that time. So he finally decides, you could never do this today, that he's going to skip any animal studies, he's going to go right to people, and he's going to run an experiment that he called the hygienic table trials in which he's basically going to poison his colleagues, right? Oh, his colleagues. Are, is he, are they going to know about this, or is he going to sneak it in on them? No, you know, it was a really interesting experiment. And basically what he did is he sent out a call for volunteers. And he got some funding from Congress so that he could set up this experiment. They built a kitchen and a dining room in the basement of the U.S. Department of Agriculture building. And then they sent out recruitment notices in which they said to young, young government workers who made very little money, we'll give you three free meals a day, and it'll be fabulous food. We've hired a professional chef there, all the meals, because they, they needed this sort of baseline, the meals will really be that wonderful 19th century mythological, <laughs> preservative-free, farm-fresh, wonderful thing, and you can eat all you want, but the only catch is... Half of you at any given moment are going to be adding capsules to every meal with the food additive that I'm studying at the time, and we're going to ratchet up that dose, and you're going to be have blood draws and many other medical tests, and you cannot eat or drink anything but at these meals. And people signed up in droves. He got letters from around the country. People said, pick me, pick me. I have a cast iron stomach, right? Were these all men? Yes, and, and one of the reasons they were was that my, Wiley selected for young men in their 20s because he made, you could call it a sort of turn-of-the-century male decision, but he made a decision that he thought those would be the healthiest people that he could put in the study, and he wanted really healthy, strong people in the study. A lot of these young clerks at the Department of Agriculture who volunteered 
had been athletes in college. Some of them had been award-winning runners, right? So yeah, they were really looking for someone who they thought wouldn't fold as soon as they had the taste of a preservative in their system, right? So, I mean, everyone had it because they were eating it anyway, but at the levels that they were doing it. But in this case, they it wasn't exactly a blind study because the people who were getting the additives knew because they were the ones actually adding these capsules? Yes, it was interesting because they started out trying to hide these additives. So the first of these poison squad studies, and that was a nickname given to the studies by the Washington Post that just stuck. They thought hygienic table trials was boring. Right? Which <laughs> poison is. squad is catchier. Yes. <laughs> so the first of them, they actually tried hiding the additives. It was borax, which we see today, 20 mule team sure. borax, right? and they hid it in the butter, but there was always like this kind of underground whisper network. So pretty soon people quit buttering their bread, and then they mixed it into the milk, and pretty soon people <laughs> quit, quit, quit drinking the milk. So then they just said, okay, this is not working, and so we're just gonna be really straightforward, and there will be this dish of capsules. They, will, they won't know the dose, right? And we're gonna watch them swallow these capsules. So it was so, and people criticized the study on those grounds, right? You know, that you had people who knew they were taking these, so were they more inclined to suddenly think they were developing weird symptoms, right? Right, I mean, uh, so, the, so they didn't try placebo capsules. No, it was either you were getting these capsules or you were not, right? So it was a very straightforward experiment. And you can look back on it and you can say, man, that's primitive science, mm -hmm. which it was, right? And Wiley later, when he did his first report on the Borax study, he went through all, all what he thought were the legitimate scientific criticisms. They had a couple dozen people at any given time in these studies. That's not that many people. That was how many people they could afford. Right to do do yeah, this. Sure, with. it's not a huge sample. Is right, it? Yeah. and they they and it wasn't secret. And and there were some other criticisms about you know should you have given them more of a break between the doses, right? So and so you know and and so we could have seen whether it was a different kind of cumulative effect. And he acknowledged all of that. So when you look at that study, you don't look at it and say, well, this is perfect science. But it was still a groundbreaking first kind of look at whether these were safe. And what was really interesting about that first Borax study was that he had predicted that no one would get sick. That he himself, there were a few, you know, meager looks at animals and Borax. The animals were fine. Nothing really happened. He picked it because he thought it was the safest thing he wanted to look at. And then people did get sick, you know, and it wasn't like fake symptoms. They were throwing <laughs> up. They were had terrible headaches. They were nauseated. They all had all of these GI problems. And he actually testified to Congress that that was the study that changed his mind about how he needed to approach that because that was the study. He said, I was persuaded by my own evidence that said to him, you know, we're not just sort of hyperventilating about potential dangers. We're actually putting dangerous things into the food supply and this has got to stop. Um, here's the dining room. If uh, this any of this sounds appetizing to you, you can see yeah. the poison squad. I mean, it looks very, you know, very nice, like a hotel dining room it or something. It does look like a hotel. I mean, they had white <laughs> tablecloths and rush back chairs. There was no, I don't remember they had flowers or art <laughs> on the walls or anything, but, but it was not like a, you know, depressing, dank, horrible place. Well, it wasn't a lab, exactly, That's in, right. in our sense of the word. Now, was any of this being publicized at the time? Well, it's interesting because when Wiley started, he wanted to keep it secret. And the Washington Post, they actually had this reporter at the Washington Post, George Wathwell Brown, who saw it in one of the congressional budget items and came down and realized that this was this insane study and haunted the place, you know. And, he, and Wiley for a while was telling people not to talk to reporters and he had to give that up. And once the Post started reporting on it, Everyone reported on it. It was so it was such a crazy experiment, right? And you have these young men, you know, essentially risking their lives in the interest of public health. And so there was the Post, there was the New York Times. You can find these stories in papers across the country. There were minstrel shows, there were songs, there were <laughs> poems, right? It really caught the public imagination. And if you look at some of the stories, like the New York Times, for instance, 
you'll see repeatedly in it the use of the word poison, poison, poison. Not just poison squad, but these volunteers are eating poisons, right? But poisons that are in our food supply. That's right, deliberately introduced into the food supply. So it was sending a message out to the American public that these additives that, that were, they were not even really being informed about that manufacturers were using deliberately were really dangerous. And you start again to see more of that awakening based on these studies. So what's the, the time frame between what it was about 1902 or so when he initiates the poison squad and then some time to get the data out. Right. And then sometime before any kind of either government or uh, business reaction can, can set in. That's exactly right. So it, the study starts in 1902. They published the Borax study in 1903. They continue publishing the formaldehyde report. They basically had to say, we could not continue this. People got so sick so fast, we realized we were going to kill them, and so we just cut it off, right? But some of the other ones, they continue for quite some time. And as they came out, many businesses became increasingly unhappy about this, so unhappy that, in fact, the Secretary of Agriculture, who had at one point been a Beryl Wiley supporter, start seeing him as anti-business. Is he working for the Secretary of Agriculture? Yes, it's because the Bureau of Chemistry is in the Department of Agriculture. And the Secretary of Agriculture, who was from Iowa, his name was Jim Wilson, had a vid originally been a big supporter of Wiley's work because farmers were very unhappy about this kind of food fraud because it depressed their own sales, right? So, but as these studies come out, and as the big agribusiness kind of community gets angry, and as, as the chemical industry gets angry, and as the food production mm -hmm. industry gets angry, Wilson gets more and more unhappy about these also. And in fact, he tried to suppress publication of the last of the Poison Squad studies because he was like, enough of telling the American people about this bad stuff. That, and so in general, the business community was really hostile. They hated Wiley. They were always trying to get him fired. There were exceptions to that. And, and one of the ones I write about in the book and a personal favorite of mine is Henry J. Hines. And Henry J. Hines was the uh, invented modern ketchup. He made a decision that he was going to make preservative-free ketchup. Ketchup of the time was sort of a thin vegetable sauce, often made of vegetable waste. Oh, tomato in there anywhere? A little, but they mostly <laughs> used red dye to color it red. Oh, of course. <laughs> and then they would dump a lot of preservative. It was very thin. It would slosh out like we slosh out a hot sauce today. Uh -huh. And so Heinz, when he decides to make a preservative-free ketchup, finally figures out that what it needs is a lot of vinegar because the acid in the vinegar is bacteria killing and a lot of tomato pulp because that's a high acid material and that kills bacteria. And to do that, he invents this new ketchup that he can bottle without preservatives, but the big problem with it is so thick it's hard to get it out of the bottle. Sometimes still a problem. Yes, and <laughs> so he puts this new ketchup on the market and it really takes off. And he essentially, in the course of doing this, invents modern ketchup. And it doesn't need uh, refrigeration? Uh, after you open it, you usually it want to put your bottle in a refrigerator, but you could actually leave it out for some time. And you know that with a bottle of ketchup, you can leave it out for right. some time. It, they may not have preservatives in it, but it's going to sit on the counter okay. Um, and he got very involved in fighting for the pure food movement. And so Wiley recruited every businessman he could. He, he recruited the pure food guys. And interestingly enough, he recruited women. And that, to me, is one of the most interesting parts of his story. And why did he do that? Well, it is a good question because women had no political power. They didn't have the vote at federal government level. But they, he saw them as really smart and really organized. And he would actually, you can actually find these things where he says, no one organizes and gets things done better than women. Well, it is sort of hard to say no to a, a mother. Yes. <laughs> when it comes to uh, safety issues. And women of the time, even though they didn't have the vote, they were, you know, they were organizing to change things. I mean, people don't always admire the anti-alcohol actions of the WCTU, but they were very effective at influencing policy. And there were women's clubs across the United States, and there were women organizing for the vote. So one of the things Wiley actually would do 
when he would go out to suffragette groups and he would talk to them about the importance of food safety and many of these suffragette groups took on that issue as part of one of their causes too because they saw it as harmful to families right and unfair to women who are trying to take care of their families and Wiley by the way married a suffragette <laughs> she was arrested at the Wilson White House later for, for picketing for the for, vote for the right to vote that's right so how then does business respond finally and does government put any pressure on business to respond by the time we get to 1905, 1906? So that, the answer is that business is very effective at stopping anything from happening. Again, because Again. of con congressional pressure. And money, right? There was a huge amount of money that flowed from these businesses to different congressmen. There was a wonderful book called The Treason of the Senate, which in fact tracked some of this money into the Senate. Roosevelt hated that book so much that he actually coined the term for the investigative journalists who worked, did that kind of work, and he called them muckrakers. And Men, it stuck. And it did stick. It, you know, it became a famous term for investigative journalists. So there's a lot of public acclaim for Wiley's work. You see cartoons all over the country praising what he's done to trying to keep food safe. But it's the actual federal action is still on hold, right? And so he keeps pushing, he keeps pushing, and then he gets unexpected help from a socialist writer named Upton Sinclair. Before we get into Upton Sinclair, what were the businesses actually saying? Were they, were they disputing Wiley's uh, evidence, or were they just saying that this would ruin the economy? Yeah, that's a good question. So they, they really felt that, they made the case that they, this would ruin the economy. And there was actually one congressional hearing where there was a manufacturer of jams and jellies. And he basically said, okay, here's my recipe for strawberry jam. I use corn syrup. I put in grass seed. I put in red dye. I put in a few shreds of strawberry. Or maybe I don't even use strawberry. I use apple. I bottle it up. I label it strawberry jam. He said, but that's what everyone does. And if I was forced to actually put strawberries in my jam, I would lose my business, right? This is just. So people came in and said, this is the way the system works. And if you did this, people couldn't afford to buy the food, right? And we would not, our, our profit margins would erode and the whole U.S. economy, and they would say that, the U.S. economy would suffer. And at the same time, you know, all of the businesses that felt pressured would, you know, directly try to influence this by money primarily. But they would also go behind the scenes. They went to Roosevelt. They went to the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of Commerce. And they did their very best, not so much to counter Wiley's evidence, because they didn't have counter evidence, but to portray him as a crank, a nut, a, you know, just tarnish his character to the best of their ability. And uh, what about his character, though? How um, congenial was he when it came to dealing with these movers and shakers outside of the lab? Well, you know, it's interesting because he started out, and at one point Jim Wilson talked about how charming he was and how funny he was. He could be a really congenial guy. People tended to like him. But he, as this situation with frustration over getting some kind of food safety, continued to happen, and as he began to really think that we had a system that was dangerous to American citizens, he became less of a schmoozer and more of a crusader and, and pretty rigid with it. And that allowed him, he was able, as a sort of general, marshal, general marshalling his forces, he was very effective. I think that later, especially, but he had alienated so many people in business, and he was so set on his point, consumer safety before nothing, that he wouldn't negotiate. Th that my personal opinion, mm -hmm. as someone who wrote a quasi-biography mm -hmm. of him, is that he was less effective later in, in, in trying to establish the standards because people didn't want to work with him. Right, and and he had alienated Roosevelt by that point, and and his own Secretary of Agriculture didn't trust him, and and he had become so much of a crusader that he, there were actually some of his scientist friends who were, what happened to your objectivity, right? 
And, and so, you know, it became more and more difficult for him, I think, in the federal government to be effective. How did he interact with Upton Sinclair? You know, they got along. They were both on the same side. I mean, Upton Sinclair was not a food safety advocate, right? He, I love the Upton Sinclair story. He was a socialist writer. And when he first decided to write what became a very famous novel, The Jungle, he wrote it as a serial novel about the plight of the meatpacking workers in Chicago for a newspaper in Kansas called... So he was more emphasizing than the workers' working conditions rather than That was exactly why he did conditions. it. He, I mean, and later, because the jungle became a big food you know, scandal, but he very bitterly complained that he had aimed for America's heart and hit it in the stomach. <laughs> it was not his intention. But what, what happened with the jungle, and this is what I think people don't realize, it's a novel, but it's got a lot of journalistic power behind it. He went to Chicago and he lived in the stockyards. And so the backdrop of his story about these poor workers is the horrible status of the meatpacking industry and the poison, you know, they're poisoning rats in the factory. The poison rats go into the sausage. Meat rots as it stands. They wash it off with, give it a bath of borax and add it into the food supply. And he goes so far in the jungle to the point where workers fall in the live vats. They go into the I mean, you know. I it's, mean, it's perfect Halloween reading. It is really grisly. <laughs> and so it was so grisly that his first publisher outside of his socialist newspaper, Macmillan, canceled the contract. They were like, we're not publishing this. We don't believe it. And he talked another publisher, Doubleday Page, into doing it. And they ended up fact-checking it. They sent a lawyer and his editor to Chicago, and they came back and they said it's worse than in the book. And so when Doubleday Page published the book, they sent an early autograph copy to Roosevelt. And as this became a huge scandal that Roosevelt had to deal with, Roosevelt sent a fact-checking team to Chicago. He sent two independent investigators. They came back. They said it's worse than in the book. And so Roosevelt used their report. That, and that report has never been published. It actually is. The complete report is in a vault in the National Agricultural Library. Why? Because he used it as a blackmail tool. He went to Congress and he said, I have this report. This report will destroy the meat industry. I want you to give me a meat inspection act. And the Congress literally said, no, no, sorry, 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 we're not doing that. They held hearings that only had people from, like, Swift and Cudahy talking about how wonderful everything was. So Roosevelt then released, I think it was about an eight-page summary of the report. And he said, okay, then, I'm just going to release the summary. And based on what was in that summary, which was really horrifying... Uh, every country in Europe canceled their meat contracts with the United States. Oh, wow. And people started just refusing to buy meat. And so he was able to use that to go back to Congress and said, pass that Meat Inspection Act. And when the Meat Inspection Act passed in June of 1906, it pulled the Food and Drug Act across the line, right? So even though I don't think Upton Sinclair <laughs> had ever seen himself as a food crusader. He was what we often call the tipping point. There was all that pressure, and he pushed it over the line. But you mentioned this frustration that Wiley experienced. Uh, so was, the, and of course with the Secretary of Agriculture too, his boss, uh, right. giving him all kinds of trouble. Uh, was there a parting of the ways then? Yeah, so uh, he was on the initial task force to try to implement the law. And it's so interesting because I went and I went through all these Wiley papers at the Library of Congress. And you can see the back and forth memos where he keeps saying, this chemical is really not safe. Let's not give us to kids. And then the other people in the Department of Agriculture are saying basically, oh, don't be such a baby. We think this is going to be fine. And so there's this sort of back and forth in which he starts losing more and more fights. And eventually his enemies at the Department of Agriculture gin up a fake in, sort of a uh, misuse of funds accusation against him. There's a huge hearing. He wins it because there was no, it was a false accusation. But I think finally he says, I've had enough of this. I'm not effective. And so in 1912, he resigned. Mm 
and he went over to uh, a crusading women's magazine, Good Housekeeping. Which Good was, Housekeeping, Yes, really? because the women's magazines, Ladies Home Journal was one of the most famous crusading magazines of the early 20th century, right? And so the women magazines were super investigative. And he went to Good Housekeeping. He started something called the Good Housekeeping Test Laboratories. And he started something called the Good Housekeeping Seal of Approval, <laughs> which we still see occasionally today, right? And he actually would test um, products, food and drink products that were uh, advertised in the magazine. And if they failed his test, the magazine would pull the ads. They wouldn't advertise them. So it's different. Yeah. It was a very different time. And he wrote a column for them about food called Common Mistakes About Food, which is a lot about nutrition. But he used it to advocate for, you know, continue to advocate for a better food law and for proper enforcement of the food law. So eventually, you know, he's really thought of as the father of the FDA. The FDA came later, but it was Wiley crusading away at the, F, at, at the Bureau of Chemistry who lay, that laid down the foundation of the FDA. So uh, his legacy, the wake, you might say, of that 1906 uh, pure food and drug law, um, Still with us in a way. I mean, you have uh, not that many years ago the story of red dye number two, for example, which was uh, determined to be that's injurious a, to that's health. That's right. And, and other uh, similar things, and yet we also wonder sometimes what else is still in there. Yes, that's exactly right. So the 1906 law it was really weakened by industry and the, a sort of secret handshake between government and industry to weaken the law and, it, and so a lot of the sort of basic safety standards that Wiley had proposed for it were taken out of it and eventually it became so problematic that in 1938 a better law was passed, the 1938 Food, Drug and Cosmetics Act. But some of the uh, winds from industry from the beginning of the 20th century became ingrained into the FDA. So, and, and this is not me dissing the FDA, but this, the FDA uses something quite often that's called grass, generally recognized as safe. And that can be something like, it, my favorite example, titanium dioxide. It, uses a whitening agent in paint yeah. and things, right? So nobody dies DuPont from white product. paint. So they move titanium dioxide over into cosmetics. You'll see it in some blocks and things. It's generally recognized as safe. Nobody dies from titanium dioxide in their sunblock. So now it's in food. It's never been safety tested as a food product, but we use, but it grandfathers in under generally recognized as safe. And so the uh, actual list of approved food dyes, Wiley took oh, almost 100 very toxic dyes out of the food supply when he was, and that was something he really did effectively. And then the list of food dyes that we still use today is almost entirely his list. Some of those turned out to be bad. And in the mid-20th century, there was the Delaney Amendment that took out some of the really most dangerous food dyes. People ask questions about the other food dyes, but they are generally recognized as safe, right? So they have not come out of the food supply. In Europe, they use the precautionary principle, which is there's some evidence that this could be harmful. We'll take it out until it's proven safe. So they have a very different approach. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, we see. So it's not a perfect system, but the rules that are there and the standards that are set and the enforcement that we do have has kept us a lot safer than in the 19th century. And the real risk to us today, moving way forward, is that uh, those, even those thin, what I think of as fairly thin safety net is being rolled back. And so to give you one quick example of that, the Trump administration just authorized the pork industry to basically self-inspect. That's um, always dangerous. I mean, yeah. it's just bad principle, isn't it? Though so that's what we had before the Meat Inspection Act, right, which required government inspectors in every plant. So they're actually downsizing the Meat Inspection Service, and they're going to have more and more of just industry saying this is okay. And once this was approved for the pork industry, the beef industry has come right behind us and said, we want to inspect our own products too. So we're actually, some of these protections that are 100 years old are starting to disappear again. We'll see how that ends up, but I'm not super optimistic.
it's a topic that in any event is very much alive, uh, yes. has not settled at all. Yes. Deborah Blum, it's been a pleasure. Um, I want to say a dubious pleasure, but no, <laughs> completely a pleasure. No, <laughs> everyone to, says dubious, <laughs> right. Talking to you again, and it's, it's certainly colorful times, and as I say, still very much alive. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I'm amazed at how applicable it is to today, and thank you so much for having me on. I'm Norman Gilliland, and I hope you can join me next time around for University Place Presents. <laughs>